Uh, just another XQCD comment that at the end you can go fetch it. It's number 413. At the end they import soul. You've seen a lot of just import anti gravity, import soul. Uh, later I'll show you something similar. I'm going to import cloud and do cool stuff in the cloud. Okay, so I'm just going to go through some more advanced things in the IPython, uh, well, IPython in general, but specifically the notebook. Um, there's, there should be up on the uh, schedule some, uh, a link to the notebook that I'm, I'm running here, so you can run it along if you want. As I said before, these are uh, 0.13. Um, this is an open 13 notebook, so you will need open 13 of the IPython installation. Um, the reason is this is kind of some some cool stuff, and cool stuff is usually new stuff. So uh, I'll write down how they can do this. Yeah, maybe I should just because. Um, one of my commands before might have been wrong. So you say en package, it's called installer. This might be why it, uh, I don't know why they do this. Uh, this might be why it failed. So you do this and you do um, like Python. And it should upgrade to 0.13. Yeah. And with the sudo, uh, that's not. All right. Not show me the... Okay. Uh, <laughs> where did it go? It was in full screen, right? Oh, maybe that's... It's because it, it treats it like an extra desktop. So, so it's like, in the end? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I hate this yeah. gear and stuff. They kind of screwed that up. Should All right. Act. Did this work? Damn it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> um, all right, so let's get started. So first of all, just I'll just go through a couple of things that uh, you can use for just just development stuff, something that makes it easier to get your stuff done. So obviously you've all seen the, oops, the question mark and the documentation that you get from that. You can also do a double question mark and you get the source and that can be quite useful if you just want to know what's going on, especially if it's not a built-in function. but one of your own function or someone else's. Um, the same thing, basically, you can get with a what's called an IPython magic, uh, because it has this uh, percent sign. So uh, this just strips away some of the, you know, some of all this shit. <laughs> you, uh, and you get a cleaner version. Uh, same thing with the source. Okay, so I use this a lot uh, because you never know what's going on in, in, in the code that you download or whatever. So um, let's try to implement something that's it's kind of far. This is just a function, and we haven't uh, checked the type of this, so I'm giving it a string, and it can. Uh, add them. So let's say this was something more complex and we just want to figure out what's going on. First of all, IPython gives you a lot better let me get rid of this. Gives you a lot better view of what's going on uh, with the stack trace. So you get actual arrows pointing to where in your code things are going on. So in this case, 
we wouldn't need much more to figure out what's going on with the error message. Uh, but imagine that we would. So uh, one thing you can do is uh, this is kind of a one thing that I also use a lot is just you've written some function. Now you might want to use that in a, another notebook or in a Python script or something. You want to put it in a file. And the, the idea is you can use the notebook to do all your interactive work. You can use the notebook or IPython in general to just figure out how things work and then use it somewhere else or in, in the notebook still. So, um, Say I want to save this cell to a file. I go through the, I can write history and not the magic, figure out which number this is. So we can see here it's number eight, so I don't really have to do this, but you should still see it. So it gives us an overview of what's been running, what's been run. In cell number eight, you see the whole uh, function that we wrote and the call to it. Um, we can then say, okay, I want to save this to a file named save function, and I want to save whatever's in cell 8. So go ahead. Uh, okay. This is a bit strange. Just make yeah. So this will not work because it's already there. Hmm. Yeah, it didn't work because we already have created. Okay, it probably try to ask me something. Ask me if I wanna. Um, Override it because there's a file there already. That is why I have the F because it forces the. Anyway, let's look at it. Okay, that's very strange. Trust me that it will do it. We can use some other magic. This is running something in the shell. I'll just cat the save function uh, to see the hell. Can you import a Python? Just, just stop with an exclamation. You don't Oh, yeah, I can also just do this. Uh, but maybe something's wrong with yeah, the kernel. Yeah, try Python and, and do IPython under under version to see if you're on 13 dev or yeah. 14 dev, whatever. Okay, let's try it. It's good that you see this. And what do you say? Yep. Yeah. Whoa! Oh, <laughs> don't do this! <laughs> I might have just taken this. Which. Okay. Uh, let me start over. Now the question is. Oh, you know what probably happened? You were developing and you were seeing if you had to work in a while. Are you in a virtual yeah. environment or something? They didn't. So is this. This might be. That looks like the right interface. Yeah. But but the other one was as well. So some stuff gets cached in your browser. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's see what's up here. Uh, just want to clear everything.
should be better. Uh, okay. Um, blah blah blah. Let's try to find this function. Uh, it fails. History. Blah blah. blah. Well, that's a history. <laughs> Might not let me start with kernel. Then... Yeah. Good idea. You get to see a lot of good stuff here. <laughs> so there'll be less history. All right, number one. Save F, yes. Okay, so, so another thing that you can do here is uh, the magic run. This will run any Python script within uh, IPython. And it's pretty useful for several reasons. You, s you, saw the, uh, you saw the detailed stack trace that you can get out of it, and there's uh, uh, different uh, other things that you can do from here. So you see running it will result in exactly the same thing. So one thing that is uh, not yet in the notebook is the ability to use debugging interactively. And that's because the debugger will ask you about something and the notebook uh, does not support input from the user. Um, so what you can do really easily is um, run a Qt console. And it will, if you use this magic, it will basically start a Qt console exactly where you are in the notebook. So where, when you are there, you can, you can actually use the debug. And this magic will just take the last um, exception that happened and jump right in. So now you're in the debugger, you have uh, kind of the, the first uh, level of the stack trace. You can go up or, or down in the stack trace and set breakpoints and all that stuff. I'm not going to go into debugging here, but it's very powerful if you have something more complex. Um, so that's pretty neat, and it kind of hints to the um, architecture of IPython, where, oh, yeah. When you're in the notebook, do you have to use the magic to run the .py call? Uh, the run magic? Because you have a, I assume it's magic. <laughs> yeah. A percent run? Yeah, that's, that's when it's a magic. So do you have that? The percent sign? Yeah. So um, there's something called auto magic, which will just recognize uh, magic functions without the percent sign. And it's usually turned on. Uh, I just do it here for to explicitly uh, show you that it's magic. Yeah, so you can usually do it without. I like to do it to just not confuse it with some function or whatever. Um, yeah, so I was saying the architecture of IPython is built up so that you have these uh, kernels running and the interfaces, which can be the Qt console, which can be the, the notebook, which can be just the terminal IPython, are just interfaces on top of that and they communicate in the background. So that means that even though I'm running this in the notebook, I can just start up a Qt console and do the same stuff. Um, that's pretty helpful. So another thing that you might want to do is some benchmarking. You've written some code and it's very slow. So let's just define some uh, function. And why is this not working? Show your console. Oh, you're right. I'm in the debugger, so it's waiting for input, and uh, I got a get out of that um, and right away continue. So even though there's a kernel running in the background, that is not, that is the same. I mean, that shows that it's the same kernel, right? Because it's waiting for input, so it can't do anything else to do it. So let's just run this crazy function, which is basically just summing square root and looping just to get some calculations done. Um, Let's time it. So 
I'm putting it in a million, uh, and it's a million, and that's a loop over a million. And it takes, with the time magic, you get an over, oops. With the time magic, you get an overview of um, the time that it takes to run. So this is the CPU time, and the wall time is the actual time that you spend. Uh, so uh, you get some whatever number. Um, so that's very useful if you just want to quickly see uh, how long something is taking. You can also use the time it magic, which is a bit more uh, elaborate in the benchmark in that it runs your code three times, selects the best one. Uh, so this should take. Double percent. So usually, double percent means that, or I haven't seen any exception. So it means that you run the magic on the entire cell. So these magics are for the lines, for that line in which it's run, and um, this is for the, uh, the 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 cell. So I I think it's kind of introduced because of the notebook, where you have this cell uh, structure. Uh, I'm not sure if you can actually use it outside, but you can test that. Uh, I think in the Qt console, you can also run cells. But it's just not as, as built. Um, you see here it runs less than 3, 3.15. All right. What does it mean by one loop? Yeah, it's just. Uh, this, if I had a for function here, it'll say uh, end loops. Uh, so it's just because there's only one thing going on here. It's just it's like it, it, it scales the number of loops depending on how long each direction takes. So if you ran crazy function, yeah, then it says per loop with a hundred rather than just try it. input. You don't even need to pull it. Uh, so what are you saying? If you just make it a hundred rather than this, and run that cell now, and so you see that it did a thousand loops by default. So time it oh, runs okay. many many loops in order to get as precise an estimate of the time as possible. But it scales how many loops it does, so that you're not waiting around forever. Oh. So if you call it with a million, it wouldn't do a thousand loops because that would take a time. Yeah, that makes time. sense. Yeah, so I misunderstood that. Thanks for that. Can you okay. Yeah, you can probably specify that. Question mark. Okay, so um, one other thing that's pretty useful if you're beginning to use all these GitHub uh, uh, features where you can have gists and you can have uh, things uh, or code just simply uh, hosted on an HTTP protocol. You can use the load magic to get stuff down from the web. So I just found some uh, random uh, code from Matplotlib. It loads it. OK, so I had it before as well, but now I have two. It fetches the code, and it puts it in a, uh, a cell by itself. And you can just run it, and it works. This is a pretty uh, useful way to also share your uh, functions. If you have something uh, that works well, uh, you can simply put it on GitHub and load it from your uh, Python notebook. Uh, so let me go on to um, uh, some sections about integration of other languages. So even though Python is great, you probably all use lots of other stuff. And in particular, uh, some of you might have used R. Uh, some of you might have used Octave or MATLAB. Octave is uh, it's very close to MATLAB, uh, but open source. Um, or you might have used, or you want to use Cython, which is a C and Python mashup. 
I'll go over this in more detail. You can also use command line um, and Ruby and other things. Basically, everything that you can run from a <coughs> command line. And it kind of, um, even though IPython is in Python, uh, the whole framework lets you do some very nice, uh, just interactive work in general. So, um, and the whole, and the thing that's kind of binding it together is the, is Python and the IPython architecture. Uh, so what you need to do here is, uh, of course you need to have R installed, and RPy2, which is the binding from Python to R. So this uh, makes it possible to pass along variables from Python to R and back again, and it's really useful for, if you have some legacy code in R, you just want to run. Uh, within your uh, current work. Uh, so let's try it. Um, uh, we define some range of numbers. We define some linear function uh, on those numbers. We now run an R cell. So this is basically uh, the magic that tells you the cell would be an R. It tells, it tells the R interpreter that it should uh, or it, it passes along the variables uh, capital X and Y and as input and as output it should give another uh, variable. So what we do in here is some R stuff. Uh, we make a linear model uh, on this data and we try to see how well it, it fits. And obviously this is a pretty easy problem so it should fit pretty well. And we get even our plots are plotted in line in the notebook, and it's, that's a pretty uh, impressive thing. Uh, so what we did here was define this XS, XY uh, if in the R code, and we specified that was to be exported again into, into Python, and we can simply try to print it, and we get the coefficients of our linear function. Done in R. Uh, Octav, uh, you can try this if you have Octav. I don't, and uh, I couldn't get it installed, so I have a screenshot. Uh, and that's also a nice thing about the notebook, you can just insert images. You can't get your code to run. <laughs> <laughs> so here's an example where inline plots is working as well. Uh, you have the nice 3D plotting math plot or octet. Um, math lab. So um, let's go on and talk a bit about Cython. So you might not have heard about it. It's, uh, it's a project that tries to make it easier to optimize your code. So what you usually do if you're working in Python is that, and you have something that's, that's slow, because you might have some nested loops or something, and that's slow in Python. You want to do it, you want to write it in, in Fortran or C or whatever you used to uh, write in uh, for efficiency. But um, that's not always as easy. Uh, Cython is kind of a project that tries to make this easy. And it is an implementation. Uh, it's a language in itself, uh, but it's very close to Python syntax with the added um, notion of um, types, the variable types. So you know Python, as we talked about first day, is dynamically typed. So you don't specify types in any way. In Cython, you do that. Uh, and that's because uh, that's how C works. And under the hood, this is translated into C code. So if we load the Cython magic, uh, we can simply go ahead and write Cython uh, cell. And there's some boilerplate, it's uh, pretty uh, minimal. And basically you just write def, as you would in, in Python. This means that it will be a function callable from Python. Um, and I have basically just taken, and you know, the example from above, 
we just did some looping and some summing. And I just put in some types. So we need a large <coughs> integer n, possibly. Uh, we do a C definition in front of new variables. And, but otherwise, it's exactly the same. So we have a long integer i, and we loop with a while loop. And we can basically use Python syntax exactly in most of the cases. Uh, I mean, this whole thing is valid Python. Uh, so you just do some, uh, some extra initialization. And we can define this function. And we can now try to time this. And you see we got, what did we get before? For 10, 10 to the 6, that was something like 3 seconds. So we just uh, optimized our code by a factor of 20, 30, uh, just by putting in some stuff. So Cyclone is really cool. And what the IPython notebook does is make it possible to simply uh, put it in your cell and call it right away. So yeah, that, that's pretty amazing. And it's, I'm going to. I am using it a lot, and I'm going to use it a lot in the future, and we are too. So, yeah. You mentioned earlier that you can compile your Python code in DSO. Would you play that? Would it be just as nice as the C code? No. So, uh, compiling your Python code won't make it uh, a lot faster. It just doesn't have to compile it. So what's going on when you run a Python program is that it goes into your source code and it compiles it into some uh, representation that the underlying Python um, executor understands. And that's basically just a step that you remove. So it's faster to load it, but running it is the same. So why, why is this faster? So, yeah, so, so this is actual C code. Behind the hoods, this is translated into C code. Uh, this Cython language knows how C, uh, how to write C from Cython. So it does that, it compiles the C code and runs that. And it creates all the bindings that you have from Python that you need to do from Python to C, which can be a, a hassle if, you, uh, if you've ever tried that. But uh, this, is, this just works. The answer. I was wondering why it's faster than C. Well, C is just a lot faster. So C is a low level, well, a lower level language. So it kind of uh, lives closer to the hardware, the computer, and it's much, much faster. But it doesn't have all the nice uh, dynamically typing uh, and other uh, interactive stuff that Python has. Yeah. When I run the line time crazy function, Cyton, uh -huh. I get a bad domain error. Okay. Um, I remember something about that. So yeah, I mean, oh, uh, wait, uh, maybe try to write uh, libc math. Can you try to write, write that? This won't work for me, I think, yeah. Uh, but I've seen it somewhere. Yeah, we can, uh, we can talk about it. Okay, so, um, yeah, any other questions? Yeah. So maybe I don't understand it right, but is it this, this 
Cypon limited to then the notebook in terms of running stuff faster, or can you actually integrate that? Um, so uh, once again, Cypon here is a is a cell uh, magic, which means it it works well with the notebook because it has cell. I I think we should just try it by this. Okay, so I think it just gets it. So it just uh, creates uh, Cython uh, uh, cell in the in the Qt console as well, and it'll probably probably also work in in the command line version. Uh, I think maybe people are curious of how you would use that in a script, a Python script, mm. if we're working well outside of the Python. Uh, yes. Uh, so it's a bit trickier. You can very easily, uh, or just can very easily from Python import Cython, and you can kind of write your, or you, the whole file is then just a Cython file and looks like Python. You can basically also leave out these uh, these type declarations, and it will be uh, perfectly fine with that, but it won't be optimized in the way. So it'll. You can actually kind of write everything in Python and just uh, pretend that it's a Python file, but it is a Cython file, and you run that instead. Um, I'd recommend you to go to the Cython uh, Cython website and, and see instructions on how to put it in your scripts and run scripts. So I've basically uh, been waiting for something like this because it takes all of that out of it. You can, you can just do it inside the uh, inside. The Okay, so command line, uh, you've seen this before. Again, the double percent sign uh, runs this. this. It was a fast script uh, behind the scenes. I do some ls, I do a git st status. Um, and yeah, just works. It gives you a, a list of the output. So you can do fun stuff with that if you use ls, for example. Loop uh, over the files that you're uh, that you have in your directory. All right. Uh, next thing is Ruby. I personally have been doing a lot of Ruby in the past, and it's a very very nice language as well. I don't know if we're allowed to like other <laughs> <laughs> dynamically typed languages. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, just uh, so I was pretty pleased that. Uh, this was being integrated into the notebook as well, and you can see. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, but not this. It is, it is being done in Python. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, in case some of you have, have have done some of that, you can use that. Uh, usually, in a Python script, it wouldn't make much sense to. Include Ruby, but uh, shows you the power of, of the notebook. Can you can you call Python from Ruby? I was wondering if you could execute Python within Ruby within the IPython notebook. Well, so this is basically <laughs> <laughs> that's a good. Let's try it. Excellent. <laughs> this is why we're doing it live, so we can do all this. Okay, we're gonna do Ruby. Like, what do the docs say? <laughs> the docs says you can't do it recursively. Or, I don't know. Uh, so, how do we call something in the command line? Uh, okay, that's well, your job I'll to do. Homework. See how deep you can go in recursively. Let's talk about parallelization. So you've um, you've optimized your code uh, as well as possible. Now uh, you really need to parallelize it. Uh, so the IPython node, the I, just IPython in general has uh, this uh, complete framework for parallelization. 
And um, what you basically do is, so anticipate this, okay, this works. Anyway, um, let me go back to the, the dashboard here. If you're running uh, point 13, you have this clusters tab. Okay, I can't see. All right, uh, you have the clusters tab. You can go in and you just type, I wanna have four engines. And of course, bear in mind, this, this is running locally, so uh, you should choose the number of cores that is on your machine. Yeah. How did you get the cluster tab? Yes. Uh, so uh, in the dashboard, when IPython notebook starts, yeah. you get this dashboard, and there's the clusters tab there. Uh, you can get to it from your notebook by, uh, by using file and open. I'll give you the dashboard. So when you're in here and you say, okay, I can. I might be able to do four cores in my MacBook Air. You just start it and it's running. Now inside the notebook, so I should say this is also pretty easy to do uh, without this clusters tab. I, uh, I'm afraid to go to a console. But you can basically just run um, uh, IP cluster start and you want four engines running. So this will start, uh, like the engine that we're running, this notebook on top of will start four extra engines. And um, we then define the, we then import the parallel client, which is the base class that, base object that handles parallelization. So I'm going to import that. I'm going to figure out how many uh, how many cores do we have. Uh, I'm going to define a cluster variable, which is just all of the cores. And I'm going to set it to be in blocking mode. I'll tell you more about this. Uh, but let's see what happens. So I printed four cores, just picked up on what I started. and. I now have something called a direct view, uh, which is my cluster. So on this view, you can uh, call functions. So first thing to do um, is to go through some of the uh, functions that you, that you might want to call. So let's try just uh, apply synchronously some lambda function to all of our cores in the cluster, and it'll print out four hello worlds. Now we can also do this asynchronously. That means that it will spawn off this function on the engines and return right away, so you can do other stuff in your notebook. And then when you want to get the results, you just uh, issue a get function on the on the result. So it works in the same way. Uh, another useful thing when you're doing parallelization is you're using map. So I think you went over the built-in map function, which takes any uh, callable and a list of things, and it just calls all of the things in the list on the callable. Um, this does the same thing just on the whole cluster. So I give it a lambda, it squares the number, and I give it the number to square, and it runs. So it's not easy to see that this is working in parallel, but uh, I'll, sh I'll show you in a minute. Uh, same thing, you can do it asynchronously. You get it. Yeah, it'll, it'll push uh, the function that you want run and the numbers divided uh, into the, the cluster. So it'll only push the numbers that the actual cluster needs to run, uh, that the uh, particular engine needs to run. 
right? So it won't push all these numbers to all of the clusters. It will uh, divide them properly. Uh, so here there's four, but we could have had 10, and then there would be uh, some division of them. Can you use block? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry? Is the uh, apply state without blocking? Yes. And that is blocking, but async isn't? Yes. So um, when you're running something in asynchronous uh, mode, it'll just return. But at some point, you might want to uh, just wait for the result when, once you've finished doing whatever else you, uh, you're doing in the background or in the foreground. And you just call get, and that will wait uh, as if it was a, a synchronous call. OK, so uh, in IPython, we've shown you a lot of magic. And there's also magics that are uh, specific to parallelization. So one is the PX for parallel execution. And you see the single uh, percent sign. We just want to run this line on all the engines. So this magic does, uh, does all of the things that I've done up here. It just calls applies. But it also formats uh, the output and uh, tells you what each of the clusters uh, have the output. So next thing is the cell. Cell magic, parallel execution. Um, what I'm going to do here is just use the PyLab magic, which makes the all the engines also PyLab engines. Uh, same thing as my primary engine, uh, so that I have that available for the next uh, next cells. So we see here there's some output. So this is a nice way to view. Uh, what the cells have output, it'll make sure that it's uh, in the right order and stuff like that. If you've worked with parallel programming before, you can have all sorts of nasty uh, um, things going on with uh, writing at the same time. So what it does is just say, OK, welcome to Pilot for all of them. Now we can run something a bit more, or we can define our function again. Um, we, w we don't really have to do this. We can just go up to the cell where we had our function, and we could put the px on top and run the cell again. So that's one of the things about the notebook. You can go back and forth, uh, go up again, do some stuff again if you need to. And this time, so the px uh, magics were defined once we loaded our parallel client here. So they weren't available before. Now that we run it, uh, they will be available. But you can you can also go back up now that it's in memory. It doesn't matter if it was before that call or after. But we've just put it in here again. Uh, now, some some of you might have used uh, MPI uh, things like that for parallelization. That's, that's kind of the novel way to do uh, parallelization on supercomputing clusters. Uh, there you have the concept of scattering and gathering. So you're uh, scattering some data out to your uh, uh, out to the machines, and you make them uh, available for that uh, machine. So. In the cluster, we have the same notion of scatter. If we want some variable. Uh, scattered out uh, onto the uh, onto the cluster, we can just do it in this way. And now, with start, so what we did was define a variable start on each of the clusters, each of the engines in the cluster. And now, with that available, we can just on each engine run another function that is uh, what we've just defined here, and we can now. Uh, only run, we can now run only a fourth of the, uh, of the iterations because we have four cores. Uh, and you'll see that it finishes much, much faster. Uh, and all of them basically uh, would have added up to much longer runtime. And if you 
front end. Surely. So you might notice that this is only half of what we had before. That's because my uh, laptop only has two cores. So it can only do uh, uh, two times speed up. Uh, but you can still define clusters that have 10, 10 engines, and uh, it will still work. It's just, uh, you know, it's just uh, processes in the, in the operating system that doesn't matter if it matches the amount of cores. But obviously, if you actually do calculations, um, you, uh, you'll see that it's only, uh, it only uh, has the speed of, of the amount of cores that you actually have. So after that, we can then, if you notice, we've defined a variable called result uh, in the, on each core. We now gather that back into the front end, and we get the same stupid number. Question? Yeah. Can I, instead of one value, can I, can I send a list of four values? So for example, the, the, each core starts from a different start. That's exactly what I did, actually. Ah, right. Um, so I say the step is uh, uh, a million divided by four, and I have a list from zero to four. Yeah. So the first number will be zero, and the next will be uh, a million divided by four, and so on. So I had to do that in order to get the same number. Uh, but yeah. All right, so I should say at this point that starting, uh, starting this cluster um, running locally is just the beginning. What you can do with IPython is define, um, define other profiles, and these profiles might, might point to, an, to a, a, an IPython cluster that's running anywhere. <laughs> So you can you can have it running on some computer that's available to you with some more computing power. And you can simply, in this interface, go in and say, I want to start 32 cores on that machine right now. And it'll be available in exactly the same way as I've just done locally. So you need to be able to, uh, of course, you need to have the, the machinery to do that, and you need to uh, have access to that uh, server, and you need to set up the profile. And that can be a bit uh, difficult, but once you've done it, it's really easy. And I suspect that it will be even easier in the in the future. Uh, this is a, a pretty new um, functionality. Um, so, one thing that we can do in the meantime, while it's not that easy, is to use some very excellent services. So one thing I want to show you is something called PyCloud. Uh, let me see if I can go to the front page. Oh, OK. Um, OK, PyCloud. Uh, so this is not, like, uh, I'm not trying, I'm not getting bought by them or something, but uh, this is really a useful tool. I'll show you why. Um, you, if you want to, in the breakout session, you can actually try to play with this. They come with uh, plenty of free computing each month, so you can easily try it out for free. What PyCloud does is it has a lot of Amazon instances running. So Amazon is kind of the uh, canonical cloud computing uh, service provider, right? So probably heard of it, and you can start infinite amount of computers and do lots of stuff. Um, what you, for example, could do was buy some Amazon instance that is uh, that has a lot of uh, computing power, and you can start an IPython, no uh, IPython uh, cluster on there and run uh, your stuff through that. Um, but you'd have to make sure that you stop that uh, instance again because Amazon uh, bills you by the hour of usage. Uh, so what PyCloud has done is said, okay, we want to make it easy for Python developers to use the cloud without doing all this. 
So they uh, kind of just started lots of instances, and you then submit calls to functions uh, on that uh, on their cloud, and they will they will handle it. They'll just run your function, put it in a queue, run your function on one of their instances, and return the result. And you and you're built by the millisecond. So it only uses as much time as you. It only uh, builds you for the time that you actually use. So let's uh, try to define a problem and see how it works. Uh, so a very uh, typical example of parallelization is calculating pi uh, using uh, kind of a Monte Carlo, Carlo technique, um, where you uh, just sample random numbers in a, in a square, in the, in the unit square, and you see how many of those were in a circle. And the ratio of uh, the area uh, of the square to the circle is has a relation to pi. So uh, what you can do is, it's a pretty stupid way to calculate pi. <laughs> this is not how uh, you calculate pi with a lot of digits, and you'll see why. But it's a very good example of how to parallelize because it's so trivially parallelized. Uh, you can you can do the same problem, and because you're using random numbers, you just generate lots of points, and all the points doesn't matter which engine they're generated on; they'll be this, they'll be worth the same. So um, let's try to define that. So what I'm going to do is define two functions. I have a sample circle uh, function that basically just uh, takes the number of samples that you want. It generates a random number n times, or a random point in the unit circle, uh, unit square, and it checks if it's inside the circle. So if, if the radius is uh, less than one, it is accepted, right? So we just increment the number of uh, samples in the circle of problem. So the brute force pi function is sample all these circles, then pi will be equal to four times that number divided by the uh, total number so the to total number is kind of a measure of um, the area of the um, of the square, and m is a measure of the area of the of the circle. And of course, the more points you uh, get, the finer the line you will be able to define. The finer, uh, the better you'll be able to estimate the area. So this is uh, this is how you do this. So let me. This is too much. Let me try to see. Uh, uh, okay, yes. So this is the serial version. We just try a million uh, instances of that and it fails. That's not good. Okay, didn't I run it? Oh, I didn't run it. And. It's wrong. So uh, this will take a little time. OK, so we use the time function here. And um, and it took 11 seconds. This is our estimate of pi, which sucks. Uh, but because you're in India. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, it's good enough for physicists. So, um, now you see the, the magic, another kind of magic. So the, I should say this is, um, this actually has nothing to do with IPython. Uh, so you can run it in your script just as easily, whatever you do. Um, but we, we just import cloud, right? We want to run it in the cloud. 
So anyone can do that? You don't have to set up an account? Or you set up an account on the PyCloud. Okay. It then tells you to run one thing from the command line just to set up your uh, uh, authentication stuff. Okay. And from then on, whenever you're in a Python program, you say import cloud. You're ready. Um, okay, now let's try to do this thing in the cloud. Okay, so I'm gonna divide my number that I was running here by 10 and run it and map it out on the cloud onto 10 instances. So let's, let's try to follow it here. Um, Jobs. So you see, I've, I've run a lot of jobs. Um, that's right. So now it's actually spinning up. Oh, I should have been faster. Okay, it's, it's done. Uh, so what you saw was this this thing when I reloaded was already done, but the notebook updated slightly later, later so it had to download the result. Right? It's just color numbers. And uh, now, oh, wait a sec. Uh, yeah, so what we're doing before was just basically staging it. This is running it, sorry. And uh, divided up to two cells. So when we call the map function, uh, we're basically uh, uh, running, running it but it's asynchronously, as we were talking about before, so it's just running in the background. You then get the result just by calling cloud.result on these uh, job IDs. So from any, from any, uh, sorry, uh, from any uh, call to the cloud, you get a job ID or a list of job IDs. Uh, we should try to print that. So this is a range from this job ID to that job ID because we started 10 instances. We just call cloud result on that, and that will wait for the result. Um, and we, we type that. So uh, we, sh we should uh, run it again. I'm gonna run it with a larger end. Yeah, that, we'll do that in a second. Um, you see it's running 10 now. And at some point it'll finish those. So on these small n, it doesn't really make much sense. So that's how parallelization works. You, of course, want to... Um, <laughs> This is taking a long time. So uh, I'll tell you about uh, PyCloud in a second. It's finished nine out of 10. So um, when you're running things in parallel, you want, uh, you want the communication and startup overhead of the, or starting things in parallel to be less time that, uh, that it actually takes to run. Uh, which is uh, uh, not what's happening here. This is actually, uh, uh, I've always gotten better results, but this is the thing about PyCloud. They have an internal queue where you basically just uh, put into. So maybe all of you guys are running stuff now, so my stuff will be slower. <laughs> um, but the thing is, uh, you're not guaranteed that it's gonna run right away, but when it runs, it's been given all of the resources that you asked for. So the time that you see here is basically time that we're waiting in queue. Okay, let's try to do something a bit more heavy. So I'm gonna start this now because it's gonna take a long time um, for my puny laptop. Um, and why I do that, I should probably show you the, the notebook cloud. Um, so another service that's kind of, uh, there's a lot of services 
uh, coming to life because uh, things are not at this moment as easy as, as they should be. Um, so a service like this is kind of a, um, we will spin up an Amazon instance for you with the IPython notebook inter interface running. So imagine that you're all having problems with running uh, the notebook or uh, you just want something and you want to run it from your iPad. You can go here, you can spin up any instance of Amazon and in fact we should just do it. Uh, so this requires that you have an Amazon account, an EC2 uh, account, and you will be um, you'll, you'll be charged by the hour. If you sign up for Amazon right now, there's a free tier that's big, so uh, you won't pay them uh, until you use it for lots of competition. Um, but let's spawn up an instance here. I'm choosing the micro because this is the cheapest. Um, okay, still uh, trying to calculate pi. And this is pending. So Amazon instances is basically you spawn a virtual computer in the Amazon cloud. And that computer, just like your Windows computer, has to boot. It takes, takes some time. Um, so that's what it's doing. Um, but once you have it up and running, uh, you can uh, you can SSH into it, and it's a uh, Linux computer like any else, any other computer. Um, and what this service then does is make sure that all of the IPython stuff is installed. It actually has all of the SciPy uh, plotting and everything that you you've learned in this bootcamp, it has, has the R, the Octave, and the Cython magics just working. So that is a, a pretty neat service. So now it's, it says it's serving. So what you do is you go here and there's an error. And that's basically because this, uh, they don't, uh, they're not able to create a, a verified SSL certificate for every machine, so they just do a self-signed one, and your browser is told if you see a self-signed uh, certificate because it's running on HTTPS, show me this warning as you proceed. Now, I will probably not remember. So you set a password for your notebooks in the uh, notebook cloud, and that will be uh, just uh, minimal security so no one can get into it. And you see we have the running on some Amazon instance somewhere, we have the newest IPython notebook, and we can basically just get started. The new notebook. It just works. So, um, you also have the clusters thing here. If this was a larger instance, this is a micro instance, so there's only one core. You can select instance on Amazon with basically many cores as you want. And there's one called Death Star, which is I think 64 cores. You just start whatever you want. Boom. And you can now run your notebook export it from your local notebook, run it here. Uh, I spent some time yesterday and I was frustrated that these guys didn't just take it one step further and provided you with a cluster that you can connect your local notebook to. That, that would make a lot of sense, uh, but they didn't. And you can't do it because uh, uh, you can't SSH into the, these machines, but you can run the notebook from here. You can just export your, your uh, local notebook if you want. Uh, I'm pretty sure it'll, it'll, it'll come in a short amount of time. So let's uh, stop this again so Amazon won't take all my money. 
and maybe our high calculation is finished. Yes. So it take it took uh, 108 seconds. Now let's try it. What do you say? 50 machines in the cloud. Maybe I shouldn't. Uh, just to avoid the overhead. Get jits, and it's running. Now we're back to the PyCloud sample. Uh, we see there's 20 jobs um, being um, in, in queue. So let's hope that the queue is not too bad at this point. We should hopefully be able to see some improvement. You can see by going to a larger n, we are actually getting better at calculating pi, but it's very computationally stupid. What is, why are you have three values here? I printed the, oops, it's finished. So this took 42 seconds. <laughs> oh, wait a second. Did it take 42 Oh, point one eight. Yeah, yeah, that's that means not eight. Yeah, it took for two seconds. Okay. Uh, now let's do something that we can't even do on our local machine. It'll take forever. Do you execute that? No. Uh, no. Um, I'm just gonna. Okay. Uh, why don't we just run on 100? Say go for it. So what we'll do here is we're running uh, 10 million on each of the 100 uh, instances. Let's see if it's faster. It'll definitely be a better um, approximation of pi. Uh, so did you ask? Yeah, I printed. Um, I printed the um, the pi that I calculated and the pi, the real pi, that is in NumPy, and uh, the the difference. Let's get a analog precision. Uh, let's go to PyCloud to see if. Okay, so it's running 68 of my 100 machines. And uh, we'll finish at some point. Uh, this would have taken an hour to run on my laptop. Or more. Um, so, yeah, I think I, while I'm Waiting for the results. Uh, maybe there's some questions. Yeah. So, what is the good strategy for experimentation? You mentioned that C code runs much faster than. Okay, it's done. And Sorry. Right now, for example, we are basically using computational power in Wayne because we're using Python unoptimized code. Yes. So, what's the good strategy for like a big project? Yeah, yeah. So that's a very good question. And um, what I didn't tell you here, but you'll see in the the breakout session is that the magic that we're running, so for example, the, where are we at? Uh, okay, up here. The Cython magic, nothing stops you from defining this cell in parallel. So basically you can go ahead and you can put C code on all of your cores and you can have Python, the glue, to kind of handle all, all that, and IPython, uh, and it just works because it's just IPython running on all of the cores. And imagine you start this on a 64-core uh, machine, and you can just put some of the functions that are uh, critical for your calculation. You write them in C, or critical for the performance. You write them in, in Cython. Uh, it just works. Uh, as you would expect, and that is one of the uh, 
uh, one of the things if you get to it in the in the breakout session. Um, so while we were talking, this thing finished in 89 seconds because it was running on 100 machines in parallel. And as I told you, we wouldn't even be able to do this today on a laptop. So it really shows the power of, of running things in the cloud if you want. Let's just go in and take a look at my... So as you can see, I've been running lots of shit in this... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, the service, they give me 20 hours of computing for free every month, and at this point I'm at one hour. Did you just open it last month, yesterday? Or no, no, I, I've had it for a couple of weeks and used it once in a while to do crazy things like this. It said one hour. Oh, that's true. Okay. Yeah. So what, how do I see? Um, okay. Uh-oh. Uh, no, but it won't be uh, more than double that. Um, so it's, uh, you have to run a lot of code to, to reach the, the limit. Any more questions? So you get charged from them, you get charged for that. Uh, is there on the queue time? There, like a month ago? charge you for Oh, for pushing data over and pulling data back. Oh, right. um, yeah. So go to PyCloud and read about it. They're actually pretty uh, open about what they do. And uh, yeah, so, so the, the idea is that's why you, there's such a large decimal number. And you can also see the inter interface is kind of new. This is a new service, but um, but they charge you for the uh, millisecond or something. Okay. So uh, that's why it's exactly that number. Oh, I actually, there's some, oh, maybe in here. Oh, yeah, here. Okay. So I've run, oh, that's something I should tell you. In, uh, in the PyCloud, in the map function, I can give it a type. And I can choose between uh, lots of different types of instances. So these instances are heavier CPU instances. You know your calculation is going to be heavy on CPU. You use this uh, C2. It's defined as, I don't know, 2.5 standard processing units. Uh, the F2 is 5, and so on. Um, and you can see my billing here. So I've used mostly uh, C1 uh, core hours, C1 cores, one hour of those, some C2 and some F2, and uh, the other things are transfer, it hasn't even registered anything yet, because I've used so little. What you can do in the PyCloud is also put large files up and they'll post it on Amazon. Um, but in my total, I've uh, I've spent <laughs> very little. Anyway, they don't even bother billing me that. So uh, getting started is very easy. Uh, you just uh, issue this um, and this, and it works. Um, yeah, you can specify the type. That will give it. That'll be even faster if you do it this way because the C two instance is faster. Okay, so uh, I think the breakout session is on the web as well, which will also be a, a version three notebook. So please operate if you're still on uh, version 0.12, and otherwise it's hard. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time yesterday trying to make it work on version 2. Uh, all of the magics and stuff uh, has been much 
improved in this. All the parallelization has been much improved in the new version. Uh, and here is the correct commands. You might want to put a sudo in front of if you're still struggling with it. Um, otherwise, come and ask. Anthot, so Anthot is a company based in Austin, Texas, and um, one of the things they do is they package up all of these packages into a single distribution so that you're not just selling Python itself, because that's kind of the most distributions these days of OSs, but all the other things on top of that. And they try to deal with all the cross-platform issues, um, and as we've seen, like some of the, some of the sort of outside codes don't always work on all machines. But they also uh, do consulting, and they even run boot camps and things like that. They charge a thousand dollars a day per person. Well, you guys did pretty well. Uh, <laughs> take donations later on. Um, so uh, yeah, they're one of the biggest uh, supporters, also of um, open source Python efforts. So they actually fund development of uh, you know, various core packages that need basically to be better. Um, yeah, and they're, uh, they're essentially friends of Python. Is it better to install an Enthought distribution or to install stuff on your own? I mean, I think Enthought is, for almost everybody, is, is good enough. And then what it's also installing is uh, other installers. So this is one type of installer. There's something called pip, there's something called easy install. If you need a third party package that isn't part of the Enthought distribution, now it's pretty trivial. We haven't told you how to do that. Kernel and the engine. Uh, so actually, uh, Paul can probably tell you a bit more about that. But I'm pretty sure in the, in the newer version of IPython, those have been uh, merged. So there's now the concept of the engine, and that is running in kernel. I mean that. So you your interface is uh, is uh, communicating with with an engine, and that's it. Google will tell you in a second. Yeah. 